Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the sixth lecture in the Golden Jubilee Lecture Series, organized by the Medical Parcel Association, Bangalore. I am Anish Thomas, one of the senior counselors here at Medical Parcel Association, who will be coordinating today's functions. As most of you are aware, the Medical Parcel Association, registered in 1972, is the first mental health non-governmental organization in India and is credited with pioneering work in the field of rehabilitation of persons with mental illness. MBS community mental health activities, especially in the area of raising awareness on mental health issues and its suicide prevention activities, Sahai, are also well recognized locally and nationally. This year marks 50 years of distinguished service and accomplishment with the Medical Pastoral Association, which is to celebrate along with everyone. One of the many programs being organized to celebrate this Colin Jubilee year is a series of lectures, which will be conducted each month. Today, we are at the sixth lecture. We are very much delighted to have Ms. Ratna Bali Ray Director of Resilience Works and the Program Coordinator for Project Rescue South India to deliver the sixth lecture in the series. The topic Madam will speak on is Mental Health Activism, A Personal Journey. This lecture will be followed by a brief time for question and answer and the comments, which is moderated by Dr. Adi or Vice President. Sajina? Hmm. May I now request the chairperson of the Golden Jubilee Committee and the current patron and honorary visiting psychiatrist of MPA, Professor Mohan K. Aisa, to welcome the gathering. Doctor was the past president of MPA for many years and currently based in Australia, such as the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Western Australia at Perth. So thank you for your presence. And now I would request you to welcome the audience with an overview of Medical Parcel Association and its Golden Jubilee celebrations. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Anish. Uh, I do not want to take much time. You have very briefly told us that this is the 50th year of the registration of Medical Parcel Association as a non-governmental organization. I want to take this opportunity to welcome all the people who have logged in to participate in this very important series of lectures. I want to particularly welcome our uh, speaker this evening, Rektamboyli Roy, who will be formally introduced by one of us a little later. I want to also welcome everybody who has logged in. And I find that there are a lot of very senior people in the field of rehabilitation, mental health in the country. Uh, I want to particularly welcome Dr. Goel, who is a logged in from New Zealand, Dr. Alok Sarin, who is a leading person in the field of mental health and uh, rehabilitation in the country, Dr. T. Murli, who is our own member, but he is uh, the immediate past president of the World Association of Psychosocial Rehabilitation. There are a lot of people from uh, you know, different parts of the country. We also find that there are very senior people from the field of theology because our current president is a very distinguished uh, retired professor of the United Theological College. Uh, I also find that there are other psychiatrists from different parts of the country. I particularly know Dr. Anil Kumar from Trivandrum. Uh, the point I wanted to make was uh, some of you, before we formally started, referred to the founder of the Medical Partial Association, the late Dr. Joyce Romney, who after her work in Bangalore went to Calcutta and worked there, started the Paripurnata organization. But in 1972, when Medical Partial Association was registered as the very first non-governmental organization in the field of mental health in India, I think she was somebody who was thinking way ahead of her times. I'm not planning to tell about her or how she started the first a home for chronic mentally ill people in the country, etc. It's all now part of history. We are delighted that we are able to observe this uh, Golden Jubilee in a fitting manner by 12 lectures. We started in February. Every month uh, uh, we will have a lecture. Uh, the lectures themselves are not attended by a large number of people. 
but each lecture is recorded you know edited and recorded and this is available on the medical pastoral association youtube all the previous five lectures by very eminent people uh, are all recorded and uh, you know some of our staff are monitoring how many people are watching this and i can very confidently say more and more people are watching the recorded uh, series of golden jubilee lectures so this is a little background in fact next week on the 3rd of august uh, 2022 which will be exactly 50 years of registering of a uh, medical partial association as a non government organization with the karnataka society based on the karnataka societies act we'll be having a major program at the mpa premises uh, where uh, you know there will be the foundation day the residents will actively participate all the residents and uh, you know the beneficiaries lot of other uh, well wishers of mpa will come and we will have a foundation day ceremony now with this uh, a very brief uh, background to the golden jubilee uh, i would like to hand over to anish who is the other shunandiya seriya ne thank you dr monai sir now i would request mr alphonse kurian kamicheri our interim secretary of mpa for the prayer sir is a sahay volunteer and a life member of mpa sir thank you for your presence and invoking god's blessing over to you sir yeah i offer this prayer especially today to request to bless all those who are working as caregivers for the residents of medico pastoral association to pray to god to give enable us to give our best and also give peace to the family members of these residents who have a lot of strain in their hearts bless our speaker for the day mr tnabol mr tnabol roy who would be sharing her experiences i request and pray god that he bless all of us who are associated in with mpa as also in all other activities this is my prayer on behalf of mpa this evening thank you our constituent sir now i request mrs rohini rajiv who is one of our active members in academic public service and publication committee and also one of our ex counselors at mpa to introduce the guest speaker over to you rohini ma'am thank you anish good evening everybody uh the seed that dr joyce romani sowed five decades ago continues to provide shade even today to anyone who wishes to rest recover rehabilitate and restart life what better way to commemorate 50 years of mpa than by having a guest lecture by another compassionate visionary warrior soul just like her there are people who are mental health activists and then there is ms ratna boli rai there is not one like any other it's my absolute honor and privilege ma'am to introduce you to the gathering here today uh just for those who do not are uh, haven't had the privilege of knowing uh ms rai let me give you a brief really brief introduction uh ms rai is a mental health activist and the founder and managing director of anjali for more than two decades ms rai has been leading uh, he has been a leading advocate for the rights of people with mental health conditions psychosocial disabilities etc in india and even in bangladesh she spearheads efforts to stop abuses within government institutions combat stigma provides skills training to effective systematic change um ratnaboli rai is an ashoka fellow since 1999 and the recipient of the prestigious alison de four award for 2016 for extraordinary activism from the human rights watch for leading the fight to move india to a rights based system of mental health care and she does this often at great personal risk i would appeal to everybody who's watching this program and who get to watch this later on to please look her up on google watch her videos because it's going to be amazing my takeaway after reading and listening to so much is one line that she shared please allow me uh, ajit sir to share this and and i'll quickly be on my way um she explained in one of her videos that right now after everything she's gone through she's absolutely unafraid to be vulnerable and for me nothing resonated more than that and i thank you so much for that and i welcome you ma'am very warmly um over to you anish thank you rohini ma'am 
Now it's time to hear from our guest speaker, Ms. Ratna Bodhi Rai. Before that, it's my immense pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's session and the discussion which will follow Dr. Ajit Vibide, our Vice President. Having introduced her, now I request our guest speaker, ma'am, to deliver the lecture. Uh, hello and namaskar, everyone. I'm really delighted and honored to be here along with names who I have always looked up to. Um, Anish, thank you for, uh, for the introduction. Just a, just a little bit of correction. Um, of course, I, I would like uh, to have resilience and be the president of resilience, uh, but, but the organization that I lead is called Anjali. And, uh, and, I, I, and, and the organization is, is Anjali, a rights-based mental health service in, in India, because we have now gone to Bihar as well. So thank you. Thank you, Rohini, for those lovely words. Thank you, Ajit, for thinking about me. Um, I, I don't know how much I'll be speaking about my work, but I'll definitely speak about my personal experience and how it intersects with, with the kind of work that I have been doing. So Anish, uh, can we have the first slide, please? Sure. I request everybody to mute themselves, everybody except Ratnaboli and Anish, of course. Yeah. So, so um, this is a very recent uh, picture that was taken in uh, Kolkata Pavlov Hospital, the largest hospital in Bengal and where I started work. Uh, many, many years ago, and I walked into this institution with Dr. Joyce Ceremony, and I had an up-close view of what was going on in that institution. Um, this is when um, I was climbing, trying to climb a tree, and one of our constituent um, members said, oh, women don't climb trees, but activists do not climb trees, do they? We will respond to that question at the end, do they have to climb trees or not? Next. So if I have to speak about my personal journey, I really have to look at uh, my childhood and growing up. Uh, one is that I was growing up um, in a household where I had committed social workers and charity workers as they were called then, my, my mother, my grandmother. And also I was growing up at a very tumultuous time of having Bangladesh war on one hand and, and the Beatles civil rights movement on the other hand. Um, I think one of the values in my childhood that I learned was that of equity and equality because, because we would be wailing at the lunch table, why am I not getting whole egg? And we would be told that you have to have half an egg because half the people of our country and, and neighboring country are underfed. And we were not allowed to waste food. And everything from skin of potatoes to skin of parwals, everything was cooked and whether we liked it or not, we had to eat it. The other thing, because the war was going on, being, being young and I think 10 or 12 at that point, I was given strips of newspaper because we had a room with window, glass windows, and we had to cover it with strips of paper. And when I asked that, why, why are you making me slob? They would say, no, because we have to cover this. We cannot have the lights shining. And um, so I would be engaged in putting up strips of newspaper in the glass window. And because where I was growing up in a nice house, there was a lot of, there were a number of slums surrounding us and, and, and I used to play with them. And I used to play with them, Gilly Danda, I used to play with them, marbles. So, and, and we were allowed to do, do that. I mean, we didn't have a sense, at least I didn't have a sense that they belonged to another class and we belonged to another class. So, so pretty much, um, the, the understanding of uh, resource sharing and um, 
declassing came from an early age, but of course I understood all of this in retrospect, not then, of course. And the other thing was, you know, Calcutta was going through immense water crisis at that point. So a corporation uh, van would come and give us water at a specific time between eight and nine. So while the whole neighborhood, it was an enclave kind of a thing and where we lived, there were about 10 houses and everyone would run to that, um, you know, huge truck carrying water from the corporation, fill the buckets and bring it home. And actually I was also given a small bucket and I would run and collect water and bring it and fill the reservoir at home. So this was kind of the, this was kind of a milieu that I was um, growing up in and, and my parents and my grandmother interacted with Mother Teresa at that point. And my father, of course, uh, came away from Bangladesh at a very early age, studied engineering, and he was also part of the freedom fight movement. Next. Next slide, please, Anish. Yeah, so um, this, this was when I, I was uh, being mentored by Dr. Joyce Siramani in Puripurnata, and I really worked very closely with uh, persons with women with mental illness. And I saw from where they came, which was Pavlov Hospital then. And, and I really heard my call, real call at Puripurnata, and it gave, gave me a sense of fulfillment, and I knew that I wanted to work for persons with mental health. Also because my, my um, you know, my studies in psychology, also because two of my aunts in my family from the paternal side were severely unwell, and one of them was suddenly disappeared and one of them was incarcerated in Ranchi and never came back. And one of them, of course, was married in North Bengal and off and on she would have relapsed and come home. So that was, that was a kind of, uh, again, a personal experience that I had in my family. And I saw that how families uh, very concerned uh, yet did not feel comfortable having uh, brothers or sisters or daughter with mental illness at home. So they had to, um, you know, keep them away because of respectability. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, this is where I also had my first, I mean, not my first, my only one huge mental health breakdown. And I completely lost my plot. And it was first Dr. Siromani who said that you need mental health intervention. And uh, Dr. Kail Narayanan, who's no longer with us, um, would treat me. I was asked to take lithium, which I refused. And then, of course, I had to resign because I was not in a position to carry on with my work with therapy and with medication, I did recover. So now in retrospect, I don't know if it was a breakdown or a breakthrough because I understood really closely um, that how, how patriarchy is a reason where you feel, uh, where you are uh, pushed at a corner and you fall sick. And, and that was a time when I used to get really angry. I was helpless. I felt invalidated. I felt unloved. And, and I used to wail and cry all the time. Um, but it took me about um, six to seven months and I recovered. I'm still on medication um, and I'm, I'm, I'm stable. I have my good days. I have my bad days, but, but yes, um, I'm in a good space now. Next slide. So when I lost my job with Paripurnata, I was also associated with a mental health movement in West Bengal. So I was spearheading that. And while I was interacting with almost 15, 16 leading organizations in Bengal working on mental health, like Antara, like Sebak, Dr. 
Murthy would know them very well. I was also preparing a uh, ground for systemic change. Now, systemic change also is, is a word which I realized much later. I just wanted to change the environment, the circumstances uh, that Pavlov Hospital was in at that point. Rampant human rights violation, abysmal condition, dingy rooms, punishment for women, seclusion cells, over medication, over pathologization, callous care, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, that was also the time when I felt very, very lonely because when I was talking to the mental health movement people, they said, "Ratna, we will never take on." the mental health system because they will never respond and you have to deal with the psychiatrist. It's very difficult. So, you know, I was pretty much alone with Dr. Kale Narayanan and with Dr. Dev Shish Chatterjee. So these two people sort of, you know, give me courage and I pushed on. I just pushed on. And it was, it was, I was also isolated in many, many ways. And while I was preparing for uh, systemic reform and systemic change, suddenly four people materialized in Pavlov Hospital and put me inside. And in those days, I didn't have a mobile phone. I didn't know what to do. I shouted. And then finally, after four hours, I was let out. And that was when my parents actually bought me a Nokia huge set, at least so that I can contact. Before that, I didn't even have a mobile phone. Next. So these are, these people are very important to us because they are part of the constituency that I work with and for. They are also the protagonists. And Anjali is not just an organization, is also name of a person who, who, who went back home, um, the first woman to go back home. The video is from Pavlov Hospital. And therefore we named our organization after her. And because I was not sure of the government response, I thought they will drive me away. I did not register Anjali for, for two years. It was much later when the funding organizations heard about our work. Dorabji Tata Trust was one of the first organization who came and visited me at Pavlov and said, Ratna, without the registration, it will be difficult to give you funds. But even then I didn't register and, and my funds used to be rooted through an organization called Moon Foundation, which was then um, headed by Devashish Chatterjee. But finally in 2001, late 2001, I actually registered with Dr. Devashish Chatterjee as one of my co-founders and few others. Um, the, let me give you a trigger warning. These pictures are, are, may, may trigger uh, extreme reactions. So I will just quickly go through these. This is what I was seeing, the institutional violence, the human rights violation. I will come to the personal backlash a bit later. Next slide, Anish. Um, so these are the pictures from uh, one of the hospitals because by that time we had spread into all the four hospitals in Bengal. So we were uh, doing our reintegration program, our capacity building program in the four hospitals across state. So these are some of the images from the hospital which was completely unacceptable. Next slide. Yeah. So this was the seclusion cell, which finally got uh, demolished only in 2015, because constantly we saw the seclusion cells were being used as center and location of punishment for women patient, because there was no seclusion cells for the men. And uh, because I was also part of the feminist movement in Bengal, um, I 
kind of mobilize the feminists together. And I also made sure that psychosocial disability featured as a legitimate constituency within the feminist movement, because before that, it was typically regarded as a health issue and an experts issue. So while they will be looking at classical women's rights and classical um, workers' rights, they will still not look at um, women with mental health condition, women with mental illness, women with psychosocial disability as part of the larger collective. So I was also kind of moving slowly to help feminists revisit their agenda. Finally, with Moitri's help, we could break down the seclusion cell with a proper government order from the D then principal secretary. And we also talked about um, prohibition of ECT without anesthesia and therefore there is a prohibition of ECT in all the public hospitals in Bengal. We are not against ECT as a treatment module, but we are definitely against ECT being administered without following the protocols like consent, like anesthetists, etc. Because I was mobilizing the feminist and the uh, sexual minority group and looking at mental health from an intersectional lens and not just as a health issue, as a mental health issue, as a psychiatric issue, there were a lot of issues that I was part of and I was taking activism on the streets. Activism should be quote unquote because I didn't know whether it was activism till many years later when I realized that participating in rallies, doing sit-ins, doing dharna is all part of activism because it's also about changing the political intent and, and since I was working with the government, it, was, it also meant that I was traversing a very thin line between um, working as a partner and also working as a whistleblower, which I will come a little later. I will take the comments at the end after I finish, maybe at the question and answer sessions. So here are some of the snapshots of the activism on streets because it, I was talking about rape, I was talking about sexual assault. Um, I was also taking out marches on 6th of August commemorating Erwadi Day where all of you know that 26 people died because they were shackled. I was also doing a campaign on unshackling. Next slide, Anish. Yeah, these are all part of the protest. This is part of the 6th of August commemoration um, where we would have um, people, survivors coming and speaking. This is, of course, the incidence of rape, which has gone up. The next is, next slide, please. This is a rape which happened inside the mental hospital and we gathered people to do a, a deputation and a protest demonstration in front of Lumbini Park Mental Hospital. Part of same activism, second. Next slide, please. Yeah. So this is when I actually realized I was an activist. The little face that you can see Behind this huge white uniform is my face when I was dragged, pulled into a police van and taken, taken to a lockup along with 11 other activists. Why? Because we were doing a peaceful demonstration in front of our honorable CM's house, which was not 144, singing songs as protest of a rape of a young woman. I was locked up um, in the cell for seven hours and it 
I cannot even tell you what conditions we were in. One of my comrade colleague was almost fainting because she didn't have a thyroid medication. We had another comrade, I mean, comrade for lack of a better word. I mean, we were all part of um, the same uh, demonstration. One of them got so hurt by the lattice that her hand broke. So, I mean, it was a terrible condition. We were not given water. Then we demanded that we be given water. Then a very dirty mug came and they said, you have to drink water. We said, nothing doing. We have done no, no wrong. Please get us bislery bottles. We want food because our colleagues are fainting. We want food. Then they got us samosas and sweets. And finally, after seven hours at the lockup, they actually discharged us from the lockup. And finally, I think they were also relieved because when they asked us our guardian's name, they wanted our father's name and our husband's name. And we said, no, we are our own guardians. We will not give you our father's name. We will not give you our husband's name. I think the IC was pretty much relieved, but that gave us a sense how this new regime can actually come on strongly on a group of peaceful demonstration on dissent. I have also worked during the left regime. We never faced this kind of a thing. Oof. Again in 2019, 49, 47, 48, I forget the number, were charged with sedition and a case was filed in Bihar. We later got to know that this gentleman was a chronic litigator. And why? We all we said in the letter to the prime minister that Jai Sri Ram was being used as a war cry. There was mob lynching. In that mob lynching, a lot of vulnerable people, women and men with psychosocial disability were getting beaten up and they died in the districts. And finally, the case was withdrawn and Vrinda Grover fought on our behalf. And this was a harrowing time because of trolling, because of constant intimidation. I received, and you know, I used to, I used to, after marriage, I used to live in a very, very middle class, you know, cooperative housing agency. And a lot of uh, letters would come in our common uh, letterbox, intimidating me sexually, intimidating me with violence. And you know, my husband used to get very, very anxious that what am I doing? I went to do social work, but what am I doing that you know, uh, these kind of letters, postcards are arriving in the common post box. But finally, I had to explain it to him and he's calm now. Uh, well, using art as resistance, I mean, um, dialoguing is one, persuasion, persuasive dialogue is another, but we were also using art as a form of resistance to bring to the public domain, um, the conditions. So on the left, you know, we, we this was an installation from Bahrampur Mental Hospital where we asked the um, residents to imagine the mental hospital as a nation and what their emblem would be and what their flag would be. So on the 15th of August, we had also this side installation. The right picture also is about the medicines, how it is thrown, it's all over the place, the horrible condition of the utensils, of the crockeries, the rancid odor. So that's the installation. And I think a lot of things changed since then. Next. Uh, along with my activism, I was also hosting a very popular show on television. I hosted that for 10 years and it was, it was trying to shift the paradigm from mental illness to mental wellness, where I was um, looking, helping the audience to look at, you know, issues like relationship and how it impacts mental health, issues like sexuality, 
and kind of um, urging people not to over pathologize the everyday behavior. Uh, so that caught on, I mean, really well, and I, I really got recognized. And, and this was, I think, a very important milestone as an activist slash social worker because this, this is a constituency, this is an audience which no NGOs can actually access. They were middle class with the earning of say 15 to 30,000 rupees, logging in, talking about their intimate issues. And I used to have a guest who used to be in conversation with me. Uh, because of the demolition of seclusion cells, I suddenly got a letter from uh, Human Rights Watch that we would like to honor you with the Alison D. Forge Award. Of course, I was on top of the world. Of course, I was happy. And of course, I was uh, really eager. But I also understood that it came with a huge amount of um, responsibility. And um, you know, it's difficult to live up to people's expectation where you have to appear invincible and which you cannot be even as an activist. So these are some of the paper clippings of, of the work that I did and pretty much in, in leading marches, demonstrations, sit-ins, and also work in the hospital and the community work that we have been doing. Next slide. Yeah, same recognition from the media houses for changing the perception and changing the language. I think people in Bengal is very, very scared to pronounce the word pagal because if anybody says P, people jump and put hands on their mouths. So don't say pagal because Ratnabuli Ray will come. So I think. The change of language is very important. And I was really uh, attentive to Anish was saying, and in his introduction, Anish said, persons with mental illness. When I used to work with Joyce Siromani many, many years back, these terminologies hadn't evolved. So pretty much with the change of perception, with the change of laws, the language is also evolving. And, and we are conscious that language can be hugely political and can have an impact. So that's a change, yeah, yeah, next. So, I mean, what is activism to me about? I mean, I have learned in a very, very hard way that uh, you have to be a negotiator, you have to be a collaborator, and with being a negotiator and collaborator, there is no contradiction being a whistleblower. I have learned from people like Alok Sarin how to contain, you know, for a lack of a better word, anger and how to make your point. Because our journey with the government is, is very, very difficult one. So while I'm working within the government space, I am absolutely not supposed to utter a word because they have allowed me that space, allowed me Bijli, allowed me Pani, all of that. But I think slowly uh, government also has taken into cognizance that I am a negotiator, I can be a collaborator, I can be a consultant to the government also, but I will not um, sort of um, fear from blowing the whistle as to where things are going wrong. And now we are asked to submit shadow reports to the government and they do act. They cannot act on all the things that we raise, but they, they are acting. For example, they're acting on the prescription audit right now. Uh, they will soon be working on the death audit in the institution. So these are some of the things um, that I understood activism is all about. Um, what defines me? I think my grit defines me. I think my perseverance defines me because when I was all alone with the Ashoka Fellowship, I used to go and sit in the writer's building with the hope of meeting the secretary who wouldn't meet. And I would sit and just look at the cobwebs. I have the determination. I have imagination. 
I'm not afraid to accept failures. Um, and yes, I'm, I have gratitude, but it's very, very lonely. It's a very lonely journey because you're always, always almost swimming against the tide. And, you know, I kind of realized that I was an activist when I was, step, I was getting criminalized by the state, when I was getting criminalized by associations like Indian Psychiatric Society, West Bengal branch. Because when I was talking about systemic reform, talking about the way food was given, the human rights violation, I was also talking about you know, diagnosis. I was also talking about the side effects of medication. And I think that was not taken in the right spirit. My attitude was not to criticize the psychiatrist's knowledge, but to build with the psychiatrist's knowledge, the real lived in experience and the lived in experience of the many into the conversation. So if I say, is psychosis NOS a legitimate diagnostic category? And do they have particular set of uh, uh, behavior? Why was I branded as, as a witch? Why, why, why was CID after me and my colleagues visiting us at the field questioning my marginal marginalized poor colleagues about what they do, what their husbands do. Do we deserve that? And because of this, there's a lot of dissonance, a lot of dissonance within me, which I at times cannot resolve. But if you ask me, how has been my personal journey? It has been full of events. Sometimes I have been able to cope with it. Sometimes I haven't been able to cope with it. Sometimes I've had a meltdown. I've had very good support from my family and from my friends and the feminist allies who have kept me alive. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ratna, for a stimulating talk. Uh, let me just check whether we can go to the video you had so kindly shared with us. Uh, not being technologically very savvy, and our real technical man is missing today. I, I will try and play the video, but you will have to forgive me if I uh, don't manage to show the video. Please hang on. Sorry, I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm not able to get the video uh, going. Uh, you'll have to excuse me, Ratna. I hope you're okay with that. Ratna, can it's you not me? important. Let's get into the interaction and I will also take a look uh, yeah, yeah. at the, the chat, comments. Chat, chat yes, yeah. please. So uh, Ratna has covered a very, very wide uh, canvas over here today. And uh, one cannot help uh, remembering people who took up the cause. And she really spoke now on the outside from what happens inside when you're, in, when you're on the inner side of receiving mental health care, such as it was. Also, one cannot help recalling the work of uh, people like uh, Philip Pinnell and Duke, who unshackled people who were uh, being treated just to protect society from dangers not thinking at all of the human angle of the person who was perceived to be perpetrating uh, certain uh, uh, evils in society. I think uh, this is the tradition that continues. Also, a very important milestone was uh, Clifford Beers, who as a inpatient in an American mental hospital, noticed the inhuman conditions over there and his book, The Mind That Found Itself. I think, Ratna, you need to follow that up and write a book yourself about these wonderful experiences that today you have shared with us. I mean, in this century, 
to have inhuman treatment, to have such inferior infrastructure in a place like a mental hospital is really, really shameful. Thank you for bringing this to light. I don't know the details of the case, but from what I hear, I will bow my head in shame for what perhaps one branch of our professional body did in uh, finding fault with what you were pointing out without being in an affronting state. In the affronting state, you really wanted to bring the human, humane angle of mental health care to the fore. More power to you on, on that particular front. Uh, from here, let's. Uh, I want to ask you one question. Do you think seclusion sells? The gender bias, of course, is very wrong, having them only for women. But do you think seclusion sells as a whole should be done away with? Ajit, uh, my own sense is that with the uh, advancement of antipsychotics and the kind of you know empathy and compassion and kindness that we are talking about, I think seclusion, we need to do away with the seclusion cells. We need to do away with that. Because what are we trying to do? We are trying to do a time out, right? And I know that the psychiatrists at times will have to do chemical restraining. So why do we need a separate infrastructure? Because it's very dehumanizing the way it is used. Because at the end of the day, psychiatrists are not there. It's the, it's the nursing staff, the other staff who actually, without the orders of the psychiatrists, put the patients inside the seclusion cell because to them they are quote unquote unmanageable. The other thing that I also wanted to clarify, Ajit, is that, you know, I am perceived as an anti-psychiatric, as part of the anti-psychiatric movement, which I am not. I think we are the only organization in India, along with perhaps Banyan, which is trying to bridge the gap between the psychiatrists and the activists world. Because we, we do speak in a different language and I'm trying to bridge that. Thank we so are much. of course critical of the psychiatric system, but we are not critical of the psychiatrists because I have wonderful bunch of friends like you, like Alok, I mean like many others in the country. But the general perception is Ratna Boli raise anti-psychiatrists, so anti-psychiatrist, uh, part of the anti-psychiatrist movement, so bash her, demonize her. I'm sure we're heading towards some enlightenment and that, that kind of demonizing won't happen anymore. I, I can assure you that. And if, it, if at all it raises its head, please come to people like us at the Medical Pastoral Association Dr. Mohan Isaac, Dr. Srinivas Murthy, Alok, myself, among many others, will see to it that when, when somebody is championing a humane cause, that that doesn't in any way uh, merit demonizing. But things have changed. These photographs are from, you know, from 2013 to 2015. Uh, Dr. T. Murli is here who had visited. I mean, things really have changed since then. At least we have ensured tonsuring be not being done. We've ensured at least warm, nutritious food. Yes, Things are, yeah. Decent cutlery, crockery, proper handling of the medicines. These are issues that you brought to light. Very, very important. Yeah. And I, I think we have absolutely no reason why those uh, simple requirements ought not to be met. Uh, uh, from here on, I'll, I'll ask people to raise their hand for any questions or remarks they might have. Uh, I'd be, we'd be glad to entertain them. We have enough time. Professor Murthy. Thank you very much. Uh, I couldn't but uh, talk about uh, in this one because the visit to West Bengal uh, uh, psychiatric institution jails in 1993 was a turning point in my career, along with Amita Danda. And uh, those of you who are interested, I have put it in the chat. The full report is available in my blog post. Are you right to me? I'll send you the 120 page one. We call it uh, uh, Unlock the Padlock. That was the title of the text. But I won't go into the report. What I want to say is that this is a very important dialogue. Ratna, thank you very much for this. For two reasons, I'm saying it. Because just this morning, I got a, a chapter from this new book, which is coming called Handbook of Mad Studies. Sounds a little odd, but it's a fantastic book. 
the chapter written by Pratiksha. She is one of the authors along with Bhargavi Dava. She is the second author out of the 34. Are essentially very much similar to what was presented by Ratna. The personal journey and the need for a dialogue to redefine mental health and psychiatry in a different way than what is occurring at this moment in the DVNC model, you know. And uh, those of us, for example, I see in the chat, uh, Prasoon Agarwal saying, is it a mental health talk or a political talk? I want to say mental health has been always a political talk. Lest you think it is something which is related to West Bengal or poor countries. I have a book with me by Thomas Insel, which came out in February 2022, where he is talking about from moving from mental health to mental illness, mental illness to mental health. He was the director of National Institute of Mental Health for 14 years with a budget of $20 billion. And he is writing, and if those of you get hold of it, it's a little expensive, about 1,800 rupees, worth it to understand. In the first chapter, he talks about all the controversies. Is it mental health, the mental health disorder, behavioral health, all sorts of things. So this is a worldwide issue that we are talking about, not psychiatry bashing, not human rights uh, one or anti-psychiatry. There are issues that we need to address it. I have two questions for you, Ratna, if you can uh, respond to it. One is that why is reform so difficult in West Bengal? Please, I'm not bashing West Bengal, please, particularly with the type of thing that we are seeing about uh, uh, the money ba bags. I'm not doing that because from 93 to now, states like Kerala, states like Karnataka, states like Gujarat, Gujarat, I mean, as bad as the Behrampur hospital. I, mean, I agree with uh, Matthew that that is the worst image of psychiatry that I have seen in my whole professional career all over the world including visiting Sudan and other places, Sudan, Somalia. So why is it, but Gujarat has made a big change and now today we have a different picture altogether. Similarly, Punjab, Amritsar hospital was very bad. Today we have a modern hospital. Why is it, I mean, is there something? Because when I remember 30 years back when we was there, they said the word for uh, jail and mental hospital are the same, you know, in Bengali. I don't know whether it's right or wrong. And that's why people, and also people, threaten people saying that we'll put you into a mental hospital as a way of threatening people. Like we say in uh, to children, you know, the uh, devil will come and take you away or something. I mean, if you can enlighten us, what is it about the culture? Not to bash West Bengal or the thing, please don't get that wrong because I think uh, that's not the purpose. But I think there must be something in the structure which is preventing the reforms to occur. The second question is a much more difficult one having failed for 30 years, because you know what we presented in 93, if you read it, you will be graphic, you know, and the Supreme Court came down very strongly, so much so that it even created another commission for the Northeastern uh, states where Gopala Subramanian did a similar report of four volumes, ours was only 122 volume one. What is it that we should be doing now? Where should we attack this issue to bring about changes like it has happened in Karnataka, Kerala, Gujarat, Punjab, and I can name any number of uh, uh, states. You know, that because that's very important for us to do as a nation to change the things. And lastly, to answer to the person, I think uh, always mental health is a political issue. It can never be away from it. And I don't think in our lifetime, at least in my lifetime, it will become just a medical issue, like a brain disorder or something. That's the point again, uh, Thomas Ensel makes it. I am against the word brain disorder because it is not just a brain disorder. It is a psych bio, as uh, Salman Akhtar put it, I'm closing it, um, uh, Ajit. It is a bio, psycho, social, spiritual issue. We have to address each one of them and as much as possible together, rather than saying it's only a biological issue or it's only a social issue or it's a psychological issue or a spiritual issue. It is a, you know, we have to make a concession of that. Thank you very much. It's a very important one. And uh, you being a narrative, like the one with this book I told you about the math studies is very important. More and more of uh, people in your similar situation should come out and talk so that we become sensitive to the other side of the things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before I allow uh, Ratna to answer your questions, this is one of the most prized gifts I received uh, early this year. It is called 
Twilight of American Sanity, a psychiatrist analyzes the age of a very famous political figure from recent times. Uh, I will not name the name, it, it figures over here. And uh, Murthy's point that politics and mental health are so closely interlinked at very, very many points. I found nothing political about uh, uh, Ratna's presentation except one reference that they were not harassed as much during the left regime. That was, that was the only allusion that seemed to me to have some political. By the way, this book came to me as a present from our dear Dr. Mohan Isaac a few months ago. Thanks, Mohan. It's a very, very delightful and incisive look into where things can start going wrong when we get too much into politics, forgetting the need for positive mental health. Uh, uh, Ratna. Oh, very quickly, uh, thank you, Dr. Murthy, for your questions. Thanks, Ajit, for clarifying. But I really like the question and the comment that whether this is a political talk or whether this is a mental health talk. Because I think within that question, there is an assumption that talking about politics is not good. I think that is something we, we need perhaps to reflect on. Because supposing as a professional, you are dealing with a person who is go going through extreme state of sadness, which in psychiatric language may be depression. And this depression could be because of the economic condition the country is going through. So how do you respond to that uh, condition or the person's state of mind without understanding the entire politics of the nation? If someone is going through issues with his or her sexuality or understanding, exploring sexuality, if my worldview and the politics is something different, do you really can you really offer solutions? So politics is not just about party politics. It's also about how you make the issue political so that at the end of the day in our country, if the political parties do not include the agenda of mental health in their work, no systemic reform will be permanent. And this is exactly what groups like us are trying to do. And to respond to Dr. Murthy's second question that when will this systemic reform will come, people like us will only be able to make temporary changes. Temporary changes because of our alliance with the media, because of helping the constituency to gain their voice and speak up. It will, systemic change will only happen when we can have the political parties, political leaders on our side and explain it to them that the development agenda has a very important intersection with mental health. Thank you. Any other comments, of, uh, Dr. Mohan Isaac? Also, uh, Ajit, things really have changed. It's not all that bad. I know Maharashtra is not doing so well. I get to hear about what's happening in, in the mental hospitals in Maharashtra. Gujarat has allocated more money. We are also trying to get more money from the government. Actually, government has now come up with an assisted living space for 80 people, which we are running for them which is also a very positive thing which has happened over the last 13 years. So while there are human rights violation, there is also this setting up of assisted living where they are also believing in the competency and agency of people with recovered mental illness. Thank you. Dr. Mohan Isaac? Yeah, <clears throat> I just want to uh... Uh, echo what has been said by others. It has been a wonderful talk. It's been a, a great going through Rekimbali Ray's uh, journey during uh, you know, the past many years. Uh, it's an ongoing journey. I agree with her that lots of things have changed. Uh, you know, I have uh, 
uh, uh, I saw in the chat box what Matthew has written, what Murli has written about their visits to various mental hospitals as part of the National Human Rights Commission uh, survey in the 90s. Of course, lots of things are changed, but lots of things are still not changed. Maharashtra, of course, has the largest number of uh, mental, uh, mental hospital beds in the country. It's one of the largest hospitals that is a Pune hospital, you know, which is uh, very close to the jail. Uh, some of us have been regular visitors. We know that the changes are occurring, but, uh, you know, the lot of changes, at least in the first two decades, were structural changes. I mean, you change the flooring, you know, the old uh, red oxide the tiles may have been removed and now you have spent money because it's easier for the... Uh, superintendents or those in charge to spend money. The functional changes are slow to occur. Uh, I, I would of course agree that the functional changes are also occurring. And as Dr. Murthy mentioned, Gujarat is one state where lots of things are occurring. And uh, uh, I was reminded of, uh, you know, the Irwadi tragedy, which uh, Dr. Uh, the, uh, the speaker mentioned. Uh, in uh, Gujarat, they have the Dawa and Dua program. Even in Irwadi, there is a psychiatric hospital where uh, you know, joint therapy is coming. Dr. Ram Subramaniam has talked about how he worked with the government to, you know, because you can't take away the faith of people. If people go to Dharga thinking that oh, there, there is where you will get care. So now there is a modern care available in Dharga. So uh, at the, on the one hand, I'm very happy that things are occurring, but all over the world, uh, lots of things to, uh, things need to occur. Next week, uh, during the World Congress of Psychiatry, there are three sessions on the CRPD. That is about, uh, you know, the uh, or India is a signatory to the CRPD. This is about the human rights of mentally ill people. Now, seclusion may have uh, been completely stopped in many places, but coercion of various types still occurs. And uh, even in uh, advanced countries such as Australia, uh, you know, there may be uh, not the kind of seclusion that we are used to in Indian mental hospitals but various kinds of coercion still like this. So this is an ongoing process. And uh, uh, one last point about the link with the politics. I think uh, we have to work with the politicians. And I believe Australia is one country where this is occurring to a great extent. For example, we recently had the election where the Labour Party won, but uh, uh, both the parties, there was uh, 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 agreement on both the parties about the importance of mental health. In fact, on the TV, we could see one of the leading figures of Australian psychiatry, Pat McGorry, having a breakfast or lunch with both the leading candidates, Scott Morrison and, uh, uh, you know, Anthony Albanese. Scott Morrison lost, Anthony Albanese won, he is the Prime Minister. So there is bipartisan support for mental health. And I think in India also, we need to get that. Every party should talk about mental health as a priority in their manifestos, etc. I think it'll take a long time. And that would mean that, that there would be a total all government approach to improving mental health. It's been a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. We have been delighted in MPA to have you, uh, Ray, Ratambali Ray. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Thank Matthew, you. thank you, Dr. Mohan. Matthew, would you like to say something? I noticed that uh, you had uh, placed on record your observations from 25 years ago. We are celebrating our 50th anniversary. You are observing the 25th anniversary of your NHRC work when you visited uh, Barhampur. Matthew? Yeah, I've, I've written. Yeah, can you say it? Can you say it? Because say. If, you can, if, no? you can say, if you can say it in brief, uh, yeah. that things I, haven't I mean, changed I've, enough. Is I've the, written many other things that I wanted to say because it will be recorded. And uh, I definitely, we, we need many more activists like Ratnaburi, because this is this is something that, as Professor Murthy said, it is going to take a lifetime of work. It will not finish in my lifetime. It will not finish in the young people's lifetime. And this is this is human nature, and this is something uh, treating our fellow human beings uh, in a in a horrible manner is something that is you know part of our bad nature. And uh, this is something that will happen. So I, I agree with Ratna that many things have changed. Many things have become different. I mean, from the old days when the medical superintendent's order was admit patients, strip clothes. That is order. Before, before chlorpromazine or anything was written, it was admit patient, strip clothes, put in cell. 
that is the that is the order in any places like west bengal and in kerala so when and, and murli and i have had many travels um, to many many hospitals in the country and um, when we questioned the medical superintendent about these orders uh, we were told that there is nothing else they could do uh, because the the police would be after them the government would be after them if they didn't put them in the hospital and i saw that first hand even in even in nimhans and this is where uh people who are not not knowledgeable come and tell us what to do i mean i i have i remember a few visits in nimhans where the health secretary would come and say why is this why is this pavilion without uh without uh, without bars where are the gates when we had the gates open he would say build the gates so we were forced to build some iron gates because some health secretary came and said build iron gates because his or her impression was that that is the way mental hospital should be behind iron bars so many things have changed and there is uh, ratna uh, just a thing to ratna that there is nothing wrong with being an anti psychiatrist and i know you are not one and the very fact that you say that you know you you are discussing and debating and collaborating with all parties doesn't make you one and you are really a collaborator but Uh, there's nothing wrong with being being an anti psychiatrist you need to listen to all our voices and that is the only way that there will be change that's all i have to say thank you thank you matthew uh, murli would you like to add anything professor murli i just want to add a very brief one i just want to show you one uh, little graph this is the graph i don't know whether you can see it we can of the You'll number of psychiatric it. beds going down and number of people in the jails going up you know it's so dramatic even today america has 12 times more psychiatric beds per capita still 90% of the mentally ill are in jails now the point which i'm making is this is a complex issue where it is not just the profession versus the people or the politicians or the press or something we all have to put our heads together to ask where do we find ways of treating people with distress with humanity rather than control that's the point which i wanted to make and this is not one of poverty i remember still uh, listening when i was working in who geneva in 2000 gavin andrews from australia said why is it in uh, psychiatry we don't have any difference between what happens in somalia versus america or australia with such vast differences there are some real issues and i think uh, ratna has really started the dialogue and as i said this book of mad studies is a fantastic opportunity to understand the complexity of it and uh, find solutions together that's my request that we should work together rather than thinking of each other as enemies thank you very much uh, contrary to what uh, matthew said uh, ratna i am very glad that you are not anti psychiatry anti psychiatry is a Uh, it is a movement that is so confused on so many planes but i'll have my private power with matthew about that later dr murli murli tailot if you are still there past wapr president and a big resource for us over here dr murli i guess he's not there alok would you like to say yes, something absolutely <clears throat> thank you thank you ratna thank you thank you ajit for asking me and thank you ratna thank you very much uh, for this uh, i think really nice talk and i think that uh, you know this is perhaps uh, what has in a sense uh, defined you and my association uh, with you for uh, for a long time it's uh, it's been a learning experience and it's it's always uh, been something that is teaches us many things learning to traverse these very difficult and as as dr murthy says very complex issues you know the fact is that there there may not be clear road maps as to how we should go it's not necessarily a 
a clash between disciplines. It is not necessarily a clash between people. It is about finding those ways forward. And I think that that is something that you have done very well over, over a, a very long time. And I think that uh, for me personally, it's been hugely uh, beneficial, hugely wonderful uh, knowing you and, and having uh, both worked with you and uh, seen in, in practice how all of these things have worked. So thank you very much, Ratna. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, both for what you have said today and um, for, for everything that uh, uh, you have been uh, and I hope will continue to be. Thank you. Uh, thank you thanks. so much, Aloka. Thanks, Aloka. I must mention that I first heard about Ratna when she had written about her aunts. And I thought that that was a solitary example. It, uh, because I was looking at uh, how people have reacted to mental illness in their relatives, with, uh, thanks to my, med my professor of medicine on account of whom I took up psychiatry, Dr. Om Prakash. But uh, then Alok asked me whether I knew Ratna and he introduced us and that I got to know Ratna almost entirely personally through Alok. So it's a delight to have you here, Alok. Uh, since people are not putting up their hands, I'm going to ask individuals to say something. Professor Anil Kumar from Tiruvananthapuram. Professor Anil. Oh, my, my, my teacher, Dr. Kalyana Sundaram is here. I'd love to hear Sundar speak. Uh, Sundar. Just, just, just a, just a moment, Dr. Kalyan Sundaram. Dr. Kalyan Sundaram, many, many years back in Calcutta, when he came from a, for a conference, he just said congratulations. You know, I was introduced to him by our dear friends Aniruddha Dev and Dr. Zina Dev. Do you remember Dr. Sundaram? Yeah. I do. I'm happy to see you. Yeah. Yeah, Ratna, I think uh, Anajit and MP. It was delightful hearing you, Ratna. I remember meeting you in Calcutta and I followed your journey very diligently, very passionately. Caring and compassion does not come easily to people. Even mental health professionals will need to dig deep to get it sometimes, caring and compassion. But to you, it comes naturally. Because when people call you activists, what you're trying to convey is, please see my point of view also. That's a plea. Because people have failed to do that. And you have made a very clear distinction between activism and anti-psychiatry. And you made it amply clear, reiterated time and time again, that I'm not anti-psychiatry. But I just want psychiatrists to open their eyes sometimes for other perspectives. There is plenty of take home messages. One is never give up. The strength comes from the inner strength and belief that you have plenty. And when I first met you there, I remember meeting you, I'm just thinking all along, listening to you. You have come a long way and I'm delighted to see where you have come. And all the awards and accolades is nothing but you well deserve things. What we need to remember is the take home messages have to be taken in the right spirit. And everybody, all my colleagues and friends have pointed it out. Psychiatry, mental health and politics, they go hand in hand in different places because one cannot live without the other in the right direction. But I think if you work together, because you are a beacon of hope for many who go through issues like what you have described. And thank you very much for giving this opportunity for all of us. And thank you for personally remembering me when I went and visited Calcutta and also met you with Joyce Zero Money. And I told Dr. Joyce at that time, this lady will go along with Joyce, take it from me. And you have not done 
anything to lessen that hope. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Joseph George. Thank you, Sundar. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Joseph George, uh, President and the former Professor of uh, Counseling at the United Theological College and the Dean of the UTC. Dr. Joseph George, you're mute. I was just typing my um, comment. Um, um, Madam Ratnamurli, thank you for sharing your life journey with us. We're struggling through mental health, the personal issues, the family, community support, as well as rejections many times. And you said there were times um, not knowing how to manage, how to, how to do. But you, so your question that became very important is um, um, breakdown or breakthrough. And you, you shared through the experience, it was a breakthrough for you. You lived a life with some, some purpose, meaning and direction. During my studies, I had I read one book, which was part of my doctoral studies at, in the US. And the title of the book is Out of Depths by Anton T. Boyson. Um, he was a um, pastoral, um, you know, he trained to be in the, in the pastoral ministry, but he could not. And uh, almost 40 years, he knows, you know, this, um, his uh, continued recurrence of illness for forcing doing, and he wrote that experience out of depths. And today, listening to you, it was more like reading that book again, out of depths, coming with a lot of challenges. And he said, um, illness, illness is breakthrough. And without that illness, there is no healing. So healing, breakthrough, and, and, and illness, he connected. And he very forcefully through his own life, uh, he said, unless there is illness, you don't experience healing. And you reminded us today with the same thought, there is illness is something that to be, to be taken seriously, make enough, enough care, and you have your healing, and there's a purpose to live in the community, which is excellent, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, are, there, are there any more comments? Because we are heading towards closing time now. Ajit, uh, you asked uh, Anil Kumar. Anil Kumar has sent a message saying that he has a problem with yes. audio. He said the excellent talk and he has now greater energy to move forward for his patients. Right. I think that was a very inspiring talk. So not surprising at all to get that comment. Uh, I will say this much, uh, Dr. Mohan Isaac, who is the chair of our Golden mm -hmm. Jubilee Observance. Yeah, please. Just one, uh, one last comment that in the 20 years of activism, I lost my hair because I really had to cut it short like this because of the lies that I was getting from mm. my friends. So from long hair, it has become like this. And, and because of this, many of the patients, when they meet me, say, which hospital you were in? <laughs> Which has been, um, when did you get released? So I love that. I think you should tell them you're in all the hospitals. You've been to all of them. And thanks for clarifying because I was wondering whether in the course of your activism, you had to tear your hair out. No, 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 no. So, uh, I have, you know, uh, yes. Sir, I have one question. Yes, yes, of course, Anish. Anybody from our... Uh, Family, MPA family. Anish, please go ahead. Uh, Ma'am, first of all, we are uh, sorry that you, the video that you have shared, we are not able to uh, send it or make others to view. Even then, we have shared that link on the chat box for others to view. Okay, okay. And uh, personally, I have gone through the video. And in that video, I have come across a sentence saying that 
medicine and therapy it has to go hand in hand and i am happy to say that our 35 of our residents they are watching the same lecture in our auditorium so we are happy to tell you that along with that then uh, that one a few of our residents they have little bit confusion like some are okay with therapy some others are okay with medicines in your own personal experience can you just tell them uh, how do you say that can you just inspire them uh, how it has to go hand in hand Oh, well, Anish, I, I I usually don't hand down prescription because that's that's not what I'm supposed to do. There are so many, so many competent people here who can hand out the prescription. All I can say is that choose your options uh, judiciously and do not uh, bash one for the other. do not think that therapy is important only important thing is to pursue therapy and not medication you know we are different individuals we respond to different kinds of methods i was in therapy for 6 years with people like devashish chatterji and others and i have healed but i have had to access medication also and even now i have to access medication without medication i cannot function but does that mean i do not take drug holidays i do i do but that is because i know myself really well i can i know the triggers i i know my pattern i know when i'm going to break down what i need so so i think at the end of the day what i would like to say anish is that you really have to know yourself and that would help you to choose the different treatment methods and there is no one prescription of that probably the most difficult task is know thyself but it is it is also the most important task thank you anish for bringing up that important point and thank you ratna for saying what you did i hope our residents will take this in the right spirit and be inspired as with the rest of your talk uh, uh, today uh, when we started these uh, uh, golden jubilee lectures Dr. Mohan Isaac pointed out that we tend to call psychiatrists all the time, and then we thought of calling some non-psychiatrists. And the first name that came to us, to my mind, was you. And thank you for obliging us and really making this evening worth its while by your active, your activism, which is inspiring to anybody. We don't want everybody to become an activist, but we want everybody to be actively involved in the cause of furthering positive mental health. you call yourself a negotiator a collaborator a whistleblower very humbly you left out the most important you are a champion you are a champion in the cause of mental health and you are a champion who is exemplary who must be emulated and who must be followed up uh, sorry whose example must be followed by all of us in the field of mental health whether we are mental health professionals or not at one level we all are indeed mental health professionals and we must recognize that thank you very much for your inspiring life story thank you for being who you are and most importantly as you said in the video which unfortunately we couldn't share thank you for being so fearless in this cause may your cause be fulfilled may your tribe increase thank you ratna for being with us this evening and over to you anish for the rest of the evening thank you thank you ajay may i leave now we'll just have a vote of thanks oh we'll... acha i i see i thought you had a internal meeting no, 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 or no, no, something no 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 no, 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 no. today nothing no, internal no. okay we, we have to see you off properly okay lovely so thank you madam technology ray for sharing your great experience and inspiring all of us thank you dr ajit for moderating the session we have come to the end of the session now i would request dr joseph george our honorable president to render the vote of thanks thank you anish indeed it was a great evening for all of us to listen to mrs ratna modi roy's raise um, life journey which includes illness 
healing and uh, and activism and uh, the the moment she said see i was i was taken by police in the police one you know those looked very little scary too to all of us but you you had gone through those with stood that shows the courage and the resilience in you so first of all on behalf of all of us i would like to express our gratitude for to mrs ratna boli for boli for being with us and giving us this uh, excellent lecture which uh, will be remembered in the days to come thank you for joining us also i would like to thank uh, dr mohan isaac who is the chairperson of the golden jubilee celebrations sitting in australia he has been doing a lot of ground work to get these lectures uh, you know on the platform and uh, thank you dr mohan for being there and doing all the the thread work for this for all of us also i want to um, uh, express gratitude to all the officers of mba vice president who was uh, the um, who was the moderator for the this evening and um, secretary sam mohan who is in the us and we have two interim secretaries mrs alphonse purian and uh, mrs tilaka uh, maskaren and treasurer dibanchana i want to thank all the officers for the support work and uh, then also i want to thank the mba team counselors and the other staff members who are you know fully engaged with all the preparations all the last six uh, like uh, last five lectures this one too so all the mba team i want to thank you also every lecture the residents at mba they listen they today also they are listening so i want to thank all the residents for listening to the lecture as well as the family members uh, who also have their interest in these lectures then i also want to thank the academic and public publication committee of mba led by um miss uh, ellen chin de who has not joined us but uh, that committee has done a lot of work with preparations and i want to thank that committee too and also um, especially ellen and um, also i want to thank uh, the the sponsor of this evening uh, the platform sponsorship micro lab thank you i don't see who is there okay so, so gratitude to all of the all of you who have been uh, on this platform and then the audience very distinguished honored mental health professionals doctors who have published and uh, still known to the to the mental health field all of you have joined this uh, afternoon and uh, and uh, made further made your contributions in the form of comments as well as uh, question and answers thank you very much we also have some theology students doctoral and master students and i recognize you and say thank you for joining and all of you other students too uh, students and staff of institutions thank you very much and uh, that is from my end did i miss anything anish yes. okay yeah. my thank internal you. internal thanks for uh, two of our uh, very uh, indefatigable members uh, thank you rohini for agreeing to introduce the speaker yes and, uh, thank you anish for anchoring today's program you did a very good job thank you thank you anish so thank you dr joseph george my pleasure thank you yeah. so here we come to the end of this sixth lecture thank you all for joining us this evening for this dr mohan wants to say something no no i just wanted to say that the recording in the next few days the staff will uh, edit this and record and it will be available on mpas uh, social media platforms that is the youtube instagram and facebook so people can watch it and you can tell others who you think might benefit from this kind of a talk also to watch and subscribe for mpas youtube that's all back to you anish so here we come to the end of this sixth lecture
Thank you all for joining us this evening for this wonderful program. We greatly appreciate your invaluable presence and willingness to find time to be a part of this session. Good evening and goodbye until we meet on seventh lecture next month. The recording of the session will be shared shortly on YouTube page. Kindly go through and subscribe it for getting updates on mental health awareness creation program. Have a great evening to all. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so Ratna. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Stay Bye -bye. well. Now you can leave. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a, have a good evening, everyone. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joseph.